Good morning and welcome to part two of our five-part series on irrigation management. This webinar series is being coordinated by Scott Sanford, Distinguished Outreach Specialist in the Biological Systems Engineering Department at UW-Madison, working in the areas of energy and irrigation. Funding for this webinar series is provided by the North Central Region of SARE. I'm John Panuska, Natural Resources Extension Specialist in the Biological Systems Engineering Department with UW Extension at UW-Madison. And today I'll be talking about irrigation water management and irrigation scheduling. So if you want to irrigate, some questions you might ask are how often should I irrigate? How much water should I apply? And how do I measure my soil moisture? These are a few of the questions that will be discussed today. Some topics discussed in today's webinar include soil water dynamics, water storage in the soil profile, plant removal of stored water, irrigation scheduling, soil moisture monitoring, and some new irrigation technologies. So we begin by looking at the soil profile. And as shown in the diagram, the lower portion of the soil profile is saturated, meaning that the pores or spaces between the soil particles are filled to 90 to 95 percent with water. This excess water, also called gravitational water, can be removed by tile drains. And so it inhibits the flow of oxygen or air through the soil profile, which is necessary for many of the chemical and biological processes required in the root zone for good plant growth. The upper diagram is the unsaturated zone, also called the Vado zone. And that zone allows for air, water, and soil to exist in the soil profile. And soil water is held in the soil profile by capillary action or surface tension between the soil part between soil particles as is illustrated in the picture to the left. The amount of water that is held within the soil profile can range from what we call field capacity, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, to permanent wilt point or hydroscopically held water, which is illustrated in the lower portion of the diagram to the left. If you consider the soil profile like a water tank, the field capacity would be considered the tank when the tank is full. And permanent wilt point would be when the tank is empty or the hydroscopic water which is not available to plant roots and therefore results in permanent wilt. wilt. So as previously mentioned, field capacity is that amount of water held in the soil profile against gravity by surface tension or essentially it is our, our full bucket uh, the, when the bucket is full of water uh, at field capacity. Permanent wilt point on the other side of the spectrum is that amount of soil moisture that is tightly held against the soil particles, uh, so tightly in fact that is not available for root uptake and is cannot be used to, to furnish plants with water and subsequently results in permanent plant wilting. So the total available water is the amount of water that is held between the field capacity and permanent wilt point levels. But not all of that total available water is readily available. And so we have a management allowed depletion or MAD portion of that total available water that can be plant extracted without creating stress on the plant. For most plants that number is around 50% of the total available water. For plants that are more susceptible to drought stress, a lower value would typically be used. 
So the readily available water, or RAW, which is what we're most interested for in for irrigation water management, is the total available water times our management allowed depletion of 50% or whatever it might be, but in most cases 50%, and that is the amount that we would be working with in our calculations for irrigation water management. This diagram illustrates the same principle uh, just a little bit differently here. Uh, this uh, particular diagram is not uh, oriented to uh, depth of soil and the soil profile, but rather to amount of water. So we'll see that up here uh, when water, we have saturated conditions, we have the highest amount of water in the soil profile, and we have a significant amount of gravitational water that needs to be removed. As that water, uh, gravitational water, is removed, we come down to the field capacity point, which as I mentioned previously, is that point where the tank, our water tank, our soil water tank, can be considered full. And then as we continue to extract water from the soil profile, uh, the initial portion is the management allowed depletion, or MAD, and that is approximately 50% of the total available water. After that point, plant stress begins to increase, uh, not all at once, but gradually, as we go continue down, farther down, and deplete more and more of that water until we get to permanent wilt point down here where there is no more plant available water. And then there is some additional water that can be dried in a drying oven all the way down to the zero point uh, at the very bottom of the scale. Another way to think of this is, is if you've ever had a, a sponge that's been sitting under your sink for a while and that sponge is all dried out and you start applying water, put it under the faucet and turn your faucet on slowly and allow that sponge to start soaking up water from the faucet. Well, eventually, initially that, that sponge will absorb all of the water that's coming to it and uh, hold it within the sponge. But once that sponge is full uh, or reaches its field capacity, then you'll start to see that water dripping out of the bottom of the sponge into the sink. And so that's uh, very similar to what's happening here with the soil profile. Uh, once you've reached field capacity, uh, that water starts to move down deeper into the soil profile. And as we'll discuss later, uh, that deep drainage or deep leaching, as it's called, can carry chemicals, agricultural chemicals and nutrients uh, down deeper into the soil profile into groundwater, shallow groundwater, or uh, also and also removes those materials from the root zone uh, where they're needed for plant production. So in quantifying the uh, water holding capacity of soil, one of the ways of doing that, uh, the soil physicists have come up with what's called a soil pressure plate device or water extraction device, where soil samples, um, as you can see, are placed in the middle of this device which has a the white part here is a porous plate and that porous plate is saturated with water as well as the area underneath uh, the chamber underneath the porous plate is saturated with water and there's a drain line uh, shown here on the side that drains water out uh, in, uh, into the uh, a container that's placed uh, adjacent to the test vessel and so each of these samples is saturated and placed on this, on this pressure plate. The lid of the pressure plate is closed and locked down tight with these bolts. And various levels of air pressure are placed uh, on the uh, soil water extraction device. Uh, initially, uh, a relatively low uh, air pressure is placed on the device and that will create or result in a certain amount of water being lost or pushed out more or less from one of these samples. And these samples are just rings, uh, little plastic rings of soil sample that are placed on top of the porous plate. And so the uh, initial amount of pressure is placed uh, on the samples uh, with a, uh, via compressed air 
and then uh, that pressure is removed, the top is opened up, and that particular sample is removed, uh, dried in a drying, weighed and dried in a drying oven, and the percent soil moisture is determined. And then the process is repeated again uh, for uh, at a higher pressure, and of course that results in the uh, removal of additional water from each of these samples. And then again, the, one of those uh, rings of soil uh, is taken out and measured, uh, weighed, and dried, and the percent moisture determined. And that process is continued all the way down to permanent wilt point, at which point a graph can be created. And this graph is what's known as a soil water release curve. And as you can see, uh, on the x-axis down here at the bottom, we have our, our pressure, or what can be considered our soil moisture tension in centibars. And again, uh, remember that this is related to uh, the soil surface tension of the soil actually pulling the water or holding on to that water or the potential uh, or propensity for that soil to want to pull water into the soil matrix as a result of surface tension. And so uh, on the y-axis over here we have our volumetric moisture content uh, which is the amount uh, of water uh, in this case uh, expressed as cubic inches per cubic inch or percent moisture. And if you go up and take a look at the graph, we'll see that at some point here up in the upper part of the curve we have saturation. And then as we continue to apply higher and higher pressures uh, or a higher and higher matrix potential or uh, suction uh, pressure potential to that soil, more and more water is released from that soil all the way down to field capacity here, which is the point we're interested in from an irrigation standpoint. And as we continue to move down the progression of these curves down to permanent wilt point, uh, that's the other point that we're obviously interested in is permanent wilt point. And so our readily available water exists at a point someplace 50% uh, uh, along this total available water curve between field capacity and permanent wilt point. All right, so our irrigation management more or less occurs in this zone between field capacity and 50% of the total available water. That's the zone that we're most interested in for irrigation management. Now also note that there are several curves on this graph. The uh, silt loam curve uh, is in the highest position and contains the highest levels of moisture at field capacity uh, being uh, about 0.34 uh, as far as the soil moisture tension and uh, a little over 30, about 35, 34 uh, percent soil moisture at about oh, a little less than 30 centibars. And if you go to the curve below that, uh, the fine sand fine sandy loam soil, note that at field capacity that soil is only able to hold about 23 percent and if you go down to a fine sand at field capacity that soil is only able to hold about 15 percent moisture. So obviously uh, soil texture plays a very important role in the amount of moisture that a soil can hold and that, of course, has important implications for irrigation water management as you get into your irrigation management system. So looking at soil water properties by texture class, as previously illustrated, um, we can see that we've got a very distinct relationship between soil texture and the total available water uh, that is uh, essentially the difference again between field capacity and permanent wilt point. Our sandier or lighter soils uh, are able to, are, are the most limited, uh, is the best way of putting it, as far as their ability to hold soil water. And as we continue down 
through the loams uh, in silt loams and into the clay loams we can see that the total available water percentage increases. Now the other uh, aspect of that is that as you get down into silty clay and clay soils uh, those soils have relatively low hydraulic conductivities making it more difficult to get water into those soils. So though they have an ability to retain uh, higher levels of soil moisture, uh, irrigating those types of soils is more difficult and typically doesn't require irrigation, um, but it does take longer, of course, to get water into those types of soils. And if you look here in the middle of the range at the loam and silt loam soils, uh, that's where we're going to have the optimal case where we can get water, irrigation water, into those soils rather quickly and we also have a good uh, significant amount of soil water capacity uh, to store water uh, in those and that's one of the main reasons uh, silt loams are considered you know, ideal or good soils for agricultural applications. Okay so the next thing that we'll want to look at is plant removal patterns from the soil profile. So if we take a look here at a typical soil profile, assuming that there are no uh, barriers or impervious uh, boundaries or plow layers, so more or less an ideal situation, we have a effective plant root zone, uh, and that being the zone where the crop extracts the majority of its water. And if we take a look at that, we can see that dividing that plant root zone into quarters, uh, four parts, we see that the first or upper 25 percent of the root zone extracts, there's about 40 percent of the water extracted from that upper 25 percent, and then another 30 percent is extracted from the next 25 percent. So essentially 70 percent of the plant water extraction occurs from the upper 50 percent of the root zone and the remaining 30 percent below that. The reason for that is primarily uh, the result of root mass in plant root mass and so the majority as you can see in the diagram here the majority of the plant root mass is in that upper 50 percent of the root zone. So from an irrigation perspective we want to consider this when we monitor soil moisture. So if we're placing soil probes uh, out in the soil profile, we want to have a probe that's going to look at the upper portion uh, of the soil profile uh, and one that's going to also monitor the bottom of the soil profile or a deeper probe. And so in looking at this, uh, we can see when water is extracted from the shallow probe uh, at 25% of the root zone depth, uh, that would be a place where we would want to uh, monitor that to begin irrigation. And when we see uh, water starting to, or moisture levels starting to increase at the deeper probe, uh, we can stop irrigating because we realize that the root zone soil moisture content or deficit has been satisfied. And so uh, these are just recommended depths. There's nothing uh, particularly magic about 25 and 75, uh, 33, a third, two-thirds. Uh, the idea here again being that we want to be able to know uh, what the moisture content is up in that active root zone and we don't want to continue to irrigate after that active root zone water deficit has been satisfied and water begins to depercolate down below the root zone. Uh, that, of course, uh, is additional pumping costs that uh, don't, need to, uh, don't need to be spent. And uh, that removal or deep leaching also takes out nitrate. Nitrate moves rather uh, easily with irrigation water as well as any other pesticides or uh, chemicals that uh, may be present uh, in the root zone. So uh, the idea here is to try to to maintain the optimal. So another factor that comes into play in irrigation water management is different crops have different root zone depths. And so we can see that uh, in addition to 
different soil types playing a factor different crop types also or different crop type also plays a factor so in the case of a potato plant we have a root zone depth of oh a little under two feet as compared to our uh, mature corn plant which has uh, a root zone depth a uh, little greater than three feet again we're assuming here that we don't have any uh, restrictive layers on these uh, root zones uh, and then the alfalfa of course uh, well, as, we, as we know has a rather deep uh, taproot type system uh, that can go down eight or nine feet now note that uh, we've got irrigation water here uh, as illustrated by the blue uh, portion of the diagram this is really the areas that we're interested in terms of irrigating and you'll see that for uh, plants that have very deep root zones, uh, such as uh, you know corn plant, uh, alfalfa plant, uh, that that uh, irrigation managed irrigation zone or management zone stops around three feet, three to four feet, uh, typically three feet. That is is primarily the zone that we can maximum that we can can manage irrigation water to or get irrigation water down to easily. And so, uh, given that the majority of the water extraction is going to take place in the the upper portion of the root zone of these plants that uh, works uh, in our favor I guess in terms of of irrigation but uh, that's the reason that we're seeing a limitation on that managed root zone but uh, looking at it from a crop perspective uh, if you have a uh, crop that has a relatively shallow root zone and is in addition uh, planted in a light, lighter soil, sandy, sandy loam soil. Your, uh, that plant's access to available water is going to be limited. That uh, both based on the depth of the root zone and the uh, amount of water that that particular lighter soil can hold. So both of those factors uh, come into play and therefore uh, when you have uh, shallow root zone crops in light soils um, such as we do in the central sands region of Wisconsin uh, you're going to be irrigating rather frequently during the summer growing season when the ET levels or uh, water extraction levels are highest so irrigating every other day is not unusual uh, in those cases again looking uh, a little uh, in more detail at the irrigation water management depth uh, for different crops. Uh, this particular chart gives some guidance uh, with regard to uh, what uh, a reasonable irrigation water depth uh, management depth might be for some of these different crops and also uh, some recommended uh, depths to place soil moisture sensors that can be used to manage that uh, root zone soil water optimally. Shallow sensor, as I mentioned previously, we tend to want to place around 25 to 30 percent of the root zone depth. Again, that's where we would know we would want to start our irrigation when we start to see soil water depletion at that shallow sensor. Uh, and then a deeper sensor placed at 65 to 80 percent of our uh, active root zone depth or managed root zone depth would be the indication of when we would stop irrigating and know that our plant root zone water deficit has been satisfied or essentially that the the tank is full so to speak any additional irrigation water applied beyond that amount creates deep leaching which removes uh, nutrients and pesticides from the root zone and therefore potentially can contaminate shallow groundwater another notation commonly used to describe soil water holding capacity is in inches of water per foot of soil as shown in the table illustrated here uh, again the fine sands you're looking at holding capacities of around an inch of water per foot of soil versus the clays uh, which is around two inches per foot of soil so uh, an example conversion uh, would be for a loam soil for total available water of about 17 percent 
in a soil depth of one foot would have a water holding capacity of around two inches per foot as compared to a sandy soil which has a total available water of around eight percent and a one foot depth would result in about a one inch per foot uh, holding capacity or roughly two times uh, the amount of water uh, in that loam versus the sand soil. Crop physiology also plays an important role in terms of irrigation timing and plant stress and the ability of a plant to uh, respond or manage water stress conditions. As shown in the uh, table, the uh, allowable depletion really represents that susceptibility of that plant to water stress. And uh, in addition to that, uh, looking at uh, critical growth periods. So in the case of all of these uh, different plants that are listed here, the reproductive period is really the critical growth period uh, for water stress. So that's the time that you would want to avoid water stress uh, to that plant. And uh, uh, water stress during that time would result in the greatest uh, impact on yield and crop quality. So when you're thinking about uh, managing uh, irrigation and reducing consumptive use uh, in an irrigation management strategy such as deficit irrigation, uh, we want to, uh, and in that particular strategy, we, we intentionally uh, put the plant into water stress. And some plants can, can tolerate that uh, better than others. So uh, clearly that's, that's very specific to the plant type. But the uh, important uh, thing to keep in mind with any sort of a deficit irrigation strategy is that you must uh, get that plant water, plant available water up again uh, near field capacity uh, or up into the uh, non-stressed range during the uh, more critical uh, reproductive period uh, for that particular plant. Another important consideration that must be observed for irrigation water management is the crop use or the amount of water that a crop will extract from the soil profile during its growth. And so that term I referred to a little earlier as evapotranspiration. Uh, really represents a combination of soil surface evaporation and plant leaf transpiration. Uh, typically, uh, soil evaporation is most significant or most critical uh, early in the spring, uh, in the early growth stages when the crop canopy is, is very minimally developed. Uh, however, once uh, you get uh, the surface layer of the soil dried out, uh, evaporation rates uh, drop off uh, significantly and transpiration really becomes the predominant factor in driving the removal of soil water uh, from the root zone. So when we look at uh, calculating a value for evapotranspiration or ET as it's commonly referred to, uh, there are two terms. Uh, the first term being a, a crop coefficient here shown as K sub C. The second term being some type of uh, evaporation or energy uh, term that describes uh, the potential or energy available to create that evaporation. Now, or evapotranspiration. Tra so, uh, transpiration is uh, an important factor in uh, plant physiology in that uh, it allows obviously nutrients to be brought up uh, into the plant, but it also cools the plant leaf. And so, uh, one of the methods that can be used to, to monitor water stress in plants is leaf temperature. And so there are instruments uh, available, uh, infrared thermometers and things, that can be used to monitor leaf temperature as an indicator of plant stress. Uh, depending on how far you want to put that plant into stress, uh, certainly that's one way to monitor is by leaf temperature and also directly monitoring soil moisture uh, is probably a more direct way uh, in, in, uh, of monitoring that phenomenon. But at any rate, uh, we have a couple of different ways of looking at the ET zero term. 
uh, we have potential ET, which is the maximum amount of evapotranspiration that can occur based on the energy input, solar radiation, air temperature, uh, the vapor pressure deficit created around that leaf. That's a maximum for a given uh, energy condition. Uh, the second is a reference crop ET approach, and so that reference crop ET approach, as the name implies, is based on a uh, well-watered, uh, not stressed reference crop, an alfalfa or a grass, and a potential ET again is that water removal rate uh, based on available energy or maximum available energy. So the, the take home message here is neither method is absolute. Uh, KCs, however, crop coefficients can differ based on the ET0 or the energy term value that you're using uh, to do that calculation. So, uh, so okay, so, so continuing our discussion about ET estimates and the amount of water that is being extracted by plants from the soil. In Wisconsin here we have uh, an evapotranspiration or ET data service that's available uh, from UW Extension, UW Extension Ag weather site. Uh, the URL uh, for that is shown here up at the top uh, of the slide and in that case we are what we are doing here is we are calculating um, evapotranspiration estimates using uh, a Priestley-Taylor equation and that represents a potential ET and those calculations are ca carried out on about a six mile square grid across the entire state of Wisconsin and uh, so the uh, uh, information that's needed to calculate that potential ET is solar radiation and air temperatures. And we get our surface air temperatures from uh, airport air surface observations that uh, are taken at airports around the state and are interpolated onto a grid provided by the National Weather Service and our solar radiation information is gathered from uh, daily satellite imagery uh, that is collected and adjusted for cloud cover for insulation. So we have uh, good estimates of surface solar radiation and air temperature from which the vapor pressure deficit can be calculated and the evapotranspiration rate estimated using the Priestley-Taylor equation. And that grid is based on uh, a reference system of latitudes and longitudes. And so, therefore, the, uh, when you're setting up the Wisconsin Irrigation Scheduling Program that we will talk about shortly, uh, the location of your field, latitude and longitude location of that field, is an important input uh, into that model so that the proper ET values will be automatically downloaded uh, from the service. Now if you choose, if you have your own irrigation scheduling program but would still like to use the estimated ET values from uh, the uh, Ag Weather site, uh, there's a service on that site uh, where you can have those ET emails, uh, ET values emailed to you uh, each day from the previous day. Uh, simply by, there's a self-service uh, sign-up uh, link uh, or location that is uh, accessible from the link up at the top of the page and you can go ahead and subscribe to that service and it is active uh, from the spring of the year through the fall of the year, uh, not during the winter, but uh, you can request uh, daily ET values uh, for up to 15 sites uh, to help you manage your irrigation. In addition to that, uh, if you have an automated system, uh, we have uh, information available on an automatic automated program interface or API, which is a way that uh, an automated uh, irrigation scheduling system can go out and pull in uh, ET values for, for any given location uh, right off the internet. So um, 
ET values are out there. They're being calculated. Uh, another important input uh, for irrigation water management, soil water management, is precipitation, obviously, rainfall. And so uh, having a good, accurate rain gauge uh, out in your field uh, is, a, is a very important thing. Uh, it is the recommendation is to have uh, three rain gauges uh, in every field. Obviously, uh, that's an ideal situation if you can if you can work that out. Uh, again, this is of course dependent on field size. Uh, if you have a, a large area that you're managing, uh, you're going to want to have uh, additional rain gauges out there to be able to capture that spatial variability in rainfall. If you're having if you have a rather small field, uh, 20 acres or less. Uh, you may most likely will be able to uh, cover that spatial variability with you know, one or possibly two rain gauges. So uh, rainfall is an, another important input into the root zone soil water balance uh, that will be used for irrigation water management. So now we're finally getting to this point uh, where we're going to talk a little bit about irrigation scheduling. So this really addresses the question of how often should I irrigate? And the way that uh, this particular approach uh, is managed is through uh, an approach called the checkbook method. And essentially what it is, is it's a root zone water balance that is created on a daily basis. And so you are tracking water inputs through rainfall and irrigation into the root zone and outputs through deep drainage and evapotranspiration and that represents a change in storage or a change in the amount of water that's available for plant uptake and plant use. So the idea here being that if you track your root zone water balance, uh, you would only then need to apply irrigation water when that was necessary. And so to facilitate uh, the application of that uh, irrigation scheduling process in Wisconsin, um, we have uh, both a manual and automated methods, uh, several different methods. Uh, the manual method is essentially a paper method where you would record your rainfall and ET and irrigation on a daily basis uh, on a sheet of paper uh, and, and, and track it. Uh, we also have a, an automated irrigation scheduling program uh, called WISP, Wisconsin Irrigation Scheduling Program. Uh, there is a web-based version of that as well as a spreadsheet version of that. And both of those are uh, easily obtainable through our irrigation water management website. Uh, and the URL will be given for that later in the presentation. There are other irrigation scheduling tools out there uh, that other states have developed and, and other folks have developed. So uh, these are fairly readily available tools that can be used to help you best manage your irrigation water. To facilitate that uh, irrigation water management effort here in Wisconsin, uh, we've put together, Scott Sanford and I put together a publication. Uh, this is an update to a previous publication that you may have heard of called Irrigation Water Management in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Irrigation Scheduling Program, WISP. Uh, previous versions of this uh, were essentially a paper version, but it goes through and explains the process of tracking uh, soil moisture on a daily basis. Uh, the URL for that particular site uh, is shown down below here and this is our uh, Wisconsin Extension uh, Crop Irrigation FYI or website, information website. It's a very valuable website. There are very, a number of resources there. I encourage you uh, to check that out. Uh, in addition, uh, Scott has also included some information here on evaporative losses. Uh, these are uh, essentially uh, losses that would occur from a sprinkler irrigation system uh, at various temperatures and relative humidities and wind speeds uh, given uh, conditions uh, more typical here in Wisconsin. Our more humid climate, uh, we don't have the evaporative losses that you would find in a very arid or more arid climate such as you would find uh, out west. 
Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, and so on. So uh, that is a, a new piece of information that's been added to, the, uh, to this publication. Uh, you can download the PDF of that publication free of charge uh, from uh, the UW Extension Learning Store. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, there's also a link available uh, to that at our uh, irrigation website, our FYI website uh, URL, which is shown in the lower right corner of the slide. So the question of irrigation scheduling and how often we can irrigate is a couple reasons for doing that or why you'd want to do that. Well, one of the main reasons is, is over irrigation. Uh, that tends, uh, that's a common tendency uh, for, uh, for irrigation operators is to, to tend to over irrigate. And of course, as, as previously discussed, uh, that uh, increases the likelihood of nitrate loss. And uh, that's nitrogen that you're paying for. And you're also paying to pump that water. So uh, you kind of get a double whammy there in terms of, of uh, loss or increasing input cost when you're over irrigating. So that's one of the advantages, obviously, uh, for irrigation scheduling is that you can apply the proper amount of water uh, when you need it. And also, you know, maintaining uh, consistent and optimal root zone moisture content is valuable uh, in terms of crop quality and yield. So uh, that's another added uh, advantage uh, to, to doing irrigation scheduling and soil moisture tracking, root zone soil moisture tracking. And in addition to that, um, if you are tracking your soil moisture uh, through one of these tools, you know what your soil moisture deficit is, and you can also monitor uh, weather forecasts and take better advantage of natural rainfall, which is, of course, Mother Nature's free irrigation that uh, uh, can also save you some money. Uh, what irrigation scheduling really cannot do is change that total plant consumptive water use. Um, that's when we start uh, looking at deficit irrigation strategies and other management approaches uh, such as deficit irrigation to, to try to control consumptive, uh, plant consumptive water use. So we've talked quite a bit about this uh, irrigation scheduling tool, WISP 2012. Uh, here's a, an introduction to it. Um, it's, uh, again, available uh, on the web and is uh, free of charge. Uh, you can go on and uh, set up your own uh, WISP account. And uh, the WISP tool itself uh, is set up to uh, have uh, you go ahead and input your information, your fields, uh, your locations of your fields, and so on and so forth. And then each year you will put in your rainfall and uh, evapor uh, ET evapotranspiration information. And at the end of the season or at the prior to the beginning of the new season, uh, the WISP software will automatically go in and zero those uh, previous year's rainfall and ET values out so that you can uh, start a, a new season, but all of your field structure and uh, setup will still be in place. Uh, for use in, in the upcoming uh, irrigation year. So uh, the WISP tool, this is a, a screen capture of the field status screen uh, for the WISP tool. And uh, you'll notice uh, down below that uh, we have the URL here for the WISP tool. So you can go ahead and uh, access that yourself and set up your WISP account. Uh, and as, uh, I mentioned with irrigation scheduling, we track on a daily basis what that potential ET is, uh, the rainfall, uh, the irrigation, those are the inputs. And from that, WISP will actually uh, estimate what your soil moisture should be. Uh, you have to put in a percent cover. Uh, there's also a way to put uh, have WISP do an estimate of uh, percent cover automatically. Uh, however, at this point, I, I would recommend putting in your percent canopy cover. That is, uh, as we previously discussed, uh, the need for crop coefficient. In this case, we're using the percent canopy cover for that, and that is found uh, to work uh, rather well. 
you will get an adjusted ET for that day and then you'll have your allowable depletion calculated over here on the right and if you're putting on too much irrigation water your deep drainage amount will show up uh, in large red letters uh, indicating of course that you don't want that to happen but the other nice feature of WISP here is that um, you can go ahead and put in your observed percent moisture and WISP will take your observed percent moisture and use it from that point forward in time so in that sense you can ground truth the model um, rather easily. Uh, the other feature here we have included is uh, a target value for uh, soil moisture. So what that would allow you to do is uh, instead of using a full irrigation strategy where you irrigate up to field capacity each time, the uh, uh, having a target or partial irrigation strategy, say 70% of what you would use. This is our, the graph represents here the readily available water. This red line represents the point where the readily available water is depleted and the area down below here re represents where plant stress is just beginning to occur. So obviously you don't want to get, you can go a little bit below that red line, but you don't want to get too far below that. Uh, because you will be increasing plant stress uh, considerably as you get farther and farther down. But uh, we'll spend a little bit of time later talking uh, some more about a partial irrigation strategy. But the idea is that you leave some uh, storage available in the soil profile for rainfall and that um, as that rainfall event does occur that will uh, the soil will have some capacity to uh, store that water and decrease the frequency of deep drainage that would occur. 70% uh, has been found to, to work uh, quite well for uh, most crops, uh, pretty common, something you might want to experiment with a little bit. Uh, the experiment station at Hancock found 70% work pretty well uh, for all crops except potato. There they recommended 80%. Another important feature or good feature here in the WISP model is this ability to report uh, your activity, your irrigation, for uh, from the beginning of the season all the way up to the current date. And what that does is it essentially uh, takes the table, uh, this field status table that's shown here, and prints it to a uh, comma-separated file uh, that can be easily imported into a spreadsheet tool such as uh, Excel, and it will give you a complete record of your irrigation activities for a given year. And as I mentioned previously, uh, the WISP software is automatically set up to go in and zero out uh, your particular inputs for any given year and get that, uh, and it does that in the spring of each year. So if you want to save your irrigation records for the previous year, you want to do that with the CSV feature in the WISP model and then you have a permanent record of your irrigation activity then you can also uh, run what-if scenarios and so on uh, using Excel uh, and you can as well in the uh, field status sp uh, page uh, put in different irrigation amounts and, and experiment with what your uh, depletion will be and, and uh, fine-tune your, your irrigation water management system. We have uh, a separate module as part of this five-part training series that is uh, focused on the operation and use of the WISP model. So that is also uh, available uh, on the irrigation website. So if you're interested in that uh, irrigation scheduling with WISP, we have a video training available for that. So as I mentioned uh, previously, the full irrigation strategy fills that soil profile right back up to field capacity uh, each time you irrigate. And when you do that, you're essentially uh, eliminating any soil water storage uh, that, or soil water deficit. You're filling the bucket all the way to the top, so to speak. A partial irrigation strategy is where you would irrigate to less than a full, uh, field less than field capacity. So say for example, 70% of the readily available water 
Uh, and again in WISP you can just put that number in and it will draw a line across the graph and show you uh, up to what point you would want to irrigate up to. And that, uh, as I previously mentioned, allows you to take a little better advantage of natural rainfall and uh, in turn reduce the frequency of deep percolation uh, or deep drainage which we want to avoid because it removes uh, nutrients uh, and uh, other materials from the root zone which we want to have there uh, for plant use. So now we're going to uh, transition into measuring soil moisture, uh, taking a look at some of the various technologies, uh, costs, advantages, disadvantages uh, of those technologies. So uh, the progression here of the discussion will be really from the simplest, uh, least expensive approach to the more sophisticated, uh, more costly approaches. And of course, uh, the least uh, expensive approach is a hand-feel method, uh, which can provide you uh, with a pretty good estimate. And uh, actually, uh, if you are able to train your eye using a soil moisture probe, so basically you would take and feel the soil and then you would take a reading with the soil moisture probe to train your eye, uh, you can get uh, very good at this method and, and be as good as a, a soil moisture probe would be. But the important uh, aspect of that is to allow yourself to have some sort of reference uh, using a probe uh, to get your eye trained and get yourself used to doing, uh, used to the feel of the soil and what that soil moisture percentage would be. Uh, this is a uh, can be particularly difficult in the lighter, sandier soils, but um, after pr with sufficient practice, uh, you can you can get very good at it. Uh, really, all you need is a shovel uh, or a, a soil probe uh, to get a sample, and uh, it, it's a it's rather straightforward in terms of, of uh, a method uh, that can be used to to monitor soil moisture. Another um, approach to monitoring soil moisture is called a tensiometer and uh, often called a mechanical root. And again, as you recall from the previous discussions uh, earlier on in the, in the webinar here, I talked about the potential for soil to want to pull water into the soil profile if there's a soil water deficit. Well, uh, the tensiometer really takes advantage of that property of soils. It really works like a root in reverse. Uh, essentially, you've got uh, a tube here. Uh, this tube is filled with water. Down at the bottom of this tube, you have a porous cup. Okay, and this porous cup is in constant contact with the soil. Um, the device contains a vacuum gauge up here at the top, and then there's a port up at the top uh, of the tensiometer where you fill uh, the device with water uh, prior to installation. Uh, you want to also soak uh, the tensiometer itself to get that, that porous tip uh, well saturated before you install it. But essentially you uh, install this right in to make a hole. I can, you can drill a hole or drive a hole into the soil. Um, you would insert this device directly into the soil. Uh, there's also a color solution you can put in there to, to monitor the water level uh, within the device. But then you would remove um, any air that would get trapped in here in the vacuum line or uh, any place in, in the top. Uh, up here there's a little vacuum hand vacuum pump that you'd pull, uh, remove any air and replace the top back in. So essentially what happens is that uh, the soil water then will uh, the soil will equilibrate with the water in the tensiometer uh, uh, through this porous tip and that will register as the soil pulls water out of that tip will register with the vacuum gauge uh, up at the top of the tensiometer. So the rule for measuring soil moisture with a tensiometer is higher is drier. So the more suction, the more matrix suction, or the higher the soil water deficit, the more it's going to pull out of that porous tip and the higher the reading is going to be uh, on that vacuum gauge uh, up at the top. And these devices of course come in different lengths so that you have them available for different uh, root zone depths. 
All right, so continuing our discussion on tensiometers, they are typically installed for only one growing season. Uh, it's especially uh, important up here in the northern climates where we have freeze conditions uh, which would uh, freeze and uh, result in cracking of the tensiometer body and, and damaging the instrument. There is also some additional maintenance required. Uh, if you have an older unit, uh, the vacuum gauge uh, can uh, tend to leak a bit over time and that would require uh, refilling and then using the vacuum pump again to remove any air. Uh, also, uh, when you have a system set up, uh, you put a color agent into that water, you can monitor that water level uh, within the tensiometer tube. Uh, these units also come in different lengths, so they can be placed in different positions or different depths within the root zone. And uh, they're relatively inexpensive, uh, 80 to $90, uh, typically less than $100 for a system or for a unit. Uh, so it's a, a relatively simple and expensive technology, but again requires a little additional uh, maintenance time and effort. Again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we talk about uh, soil uh, tension or matrix potential, at, uh, uh, which is what this device, particular device, uses, is that is that poten po po potential for uh, soil to pull water out of that device. Uh, the amount of water uh, deficit is represented by soil tension in vacuum readings in centibars. And so uh, there's some ranges given here. Obviously, uh, as I mentioned previously, higher is drier, so 0 to 10 uh, is saturated. You're not going to have really any, uh, any water deficit there, so you're not going to see much vacuum. But as your soil dries out, you're going to see more and more, or a higher and higher level uh, of uh, vacuum or uh, deficit, soil water deficit. And so based on those readings, uh, you can make uh, irrigation water management decisions. As you recall from earlier in the presentation with the soil water extraction device, uh, that's where the numbers would come from uh, for uh, various levels for the soil water release curves for different soils. So you would be looking at uh, having um, certain levels or certain uh, values in centibars that would trigger your irrigation decisions for a device of this type. Another type of device, uh, electrical uh, resistance device, uh, gypsum blocks, fairly simple. Uh, these are buried at the desired depths within the root zone. Uh, water uh, moves in and out of these blocks. Uh, they have to be uh, in good contact with the soil, but uh, they're relatively uh, cheap, uh, about $8 for the sensor and a one-time cost of about $290 for a reader uh, meter. Uh, basically it's reading resistance. Uh, one disadvantage here is that these are only the blocks themselves are only good for one season as the uh, gypsum dissolves uh, in the soil profile so uh, those need to be uh, purchased uh, each year. Uh, but again the cost on those is relatively low. Uh, as an improvement on the uh, electrical resistance type measurement, or a tensiometer I should say, is a solid state version of a tensiometer um, and that uh, is a watermark block uh, by, by brand name. It is, an, is it, a, it is essentially uh, an electronic version of a tensiometer and so uh, the sensor cost is relatively inexpensive, 35 to 45 dollars and then uh, a one-time cost of $300 for a meter, which can be obviously used to read um, multiple uh, installed uh, moisture blocks. Uh, these uh, are, can be somewhat uh, temperature uh, and soil uh, salinity sensitive, but um, the major advantage they can withstand freezing, so they can be installed uh, through the winter season. 
but again, uh, this type of device needs to be in continuous, like a tensiometer, needs to be in continuous contact with the soil. So uh, they are typically uh, installed at a fixed location, um, multiple depths at multiple fixed locations, and then uh, can be accessed uh, via the data logger, uh, or there are other technologies, more advanced technologies, that can be used, uh, meter, uh, a reading meter or a data logger, uh, are common ways to uh, to read these, and that'll read out directly in centibars, uh, just like the gauge on a tensiometer would. The manufacturer uh, for these uh, watermark blocks does uh, provide a uh, sort of generic soil water release curve. Um, again, uh, the x-axis here in centibars of soil tension, the y-axis in percent soil moisture. So you have uh, kind of a rough idea of where, uh, based on your soil texture, uh, your uh, decision points to irrigate might be. And uh, of course, again, uh, having a soil water characteristic curve specifically for your soil is the best way to go, but uh, often those uh, are not available. So something like this uh, in combination with some good field experience um, is, a, is an adequate, very adequate way to, to support irrigation decisions. Some of the more uh, sophisticated electronic approaches of, uh, that are out there. Uh, one of them includes the uh, time domain reflectivity or TDR as it's commonly referred to. Uh, these uh, are essentially uh, electric methods that are measuring the um, electrical magnetic energy dissipation in the soil. Uh, the uh, sensor for this is two rods. Uh, they're called waveguides. Uh, they're typically spaced an inch or so apart and those waveguides uh, are connected to a device um, and then that is uh, connected in turn to a cable which you would connect up with uh, a reader. Um, there's also portable versions uh, of this device that uh, you can carry right out in the field with you and push into the soil profile and take an immediate reading. Uh, you get an immediate reading in percent moisture uh, if you are using a portable device and you want a reading that's deeper, um, you can dig a hole. Just bring a shovel out, dig a hole, take your reading uh, with a portable device that way. Or these uh, TDR probes can be installed uh, as a fixed installation, as shown on the pictures uh, left and right at the bottom, or as a portable unit, as shown in the center. These uh, are uh, quite, quite often used in research. They're considered the more accurate uh, probe to be used, plus or minus 2 to 3 percent common accuracy. But uh, again, they're more costly. Uh, 800 to 1200 dollars uh, for one of these probes uh, is, is a typical price, but uh, they are very high quality data. Uh, they have, you know, they can be calibrated to site specific conditions. And again, as I mentioned, they're uh, uh, typically used in research. It's kind of interesting to note that the technology for uh, TDR, time domain reflectivity, actually came from the telephone, uh, telecommunications uh, field where they would use uh, this technology to find breaks in underground uh, phone lines. And uh, soil physicists grabbed onto that and actually turned it into a, a very good way to measure soil moisture. Uh, another type of electronic sensor uh, is called a capacitance sensor. Um, sometimes that's also referred to as a frequency domain or FDR uh, sensor. But uh, again, uh, that's similar to a TDR sensor. The accuracies are, are similar. Um, you have a, uh, again, you can get these as portable probes uh, or you can get these as in place sensors. Uh, in place sensors run around $100, uh, and then uh, a meter to read those uh, is a couple hundred dollars, excuse me. And then um, you can also get uh, data loggers uh, for, well, really um, any of these electronic devices that will continuously record uh, at the interval that you uh, specify what that soil moisture should be. 
and as we'll discuss later on here in a few minutes that uh, you can also include telemetry which sends this data uh, via cell phone modem up to a website so uh, the sky's the limit kind of on a lot of this stuff but uh, you can measure uh, it measures directly uh, volumetric soil moisture content in percent uh, low sensitivity to salinity and temperature, uh, very stable, robust type of sensor, um, and also uh, can be left in over the winter. These are uh, very commonly used. Uh, another, uh, again, electronic technology that is both portable uh, and in-place applications uh, can apply for this type of technology. So we, we get to the high end, uh, the Mercedes, uh, the Cadillacs. These are our sensors. Uh, typically they are capacitance or frequency domain sensors that um, can actually monitor the soil moisture at several depths simultaneously. As shown here, there's a, a tube that uh, contains several uh, sensors um, that will go into the ground and then that tube uh, is connected to uh, a data logging system or data collecting system uh, which in turn can be or is commonly uh, connected to a web data service um, that uploads in real time your soil moisture uh, right onto a website you can go on and, and connect directly to that um, additional devices uh, such as rain gauges and uh, air temperature gauges can also be included with these types of systems so uh, integrated with uh, a real-time weather station. Um, these types of systems are commonly used with what we call VRI or variable rate irrigation software um, so uh, several of these are, are put in, in locations where uh, soil water holding capacities differ across a field. Uh, we'll talk in a little bit later about um, some of those technologies, but then uh, irrigation water application rates can be varied uh, based on differences in soil water holding capacity. Of course, along with all of this nice technology comes uh, a rather uh, hefty price tag, um, but if uh, uh, Obviously there's a place uh, for this type of technology for larger operations and uh, it's good accuracy, uh, good convenience, uh, you know, very, uh, very, you know, very useful technology and, and very applicable for uh, many, uh, many types of applications. So in summary, uh, looking at different measurement type methods. Uh, we can have a couple of different ways to deploy those. Uh, the portable probe versus an in-place sensor. In the case of a tensiometer, uh, you're pretty much limited to an in-place sensor because you need to have that continuous soil contact. Uh, however, with the capacitance or FDR probes and uh, TDR probes uh, or wave velocity probes, those can be installed either as a portable probe or an in-place sensor. So you get a little more flexibility uh, along with that additional cost. I alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier, uh, different data collection options. Um, you can have a display only type system where you just connect up to it and it gives you a direct reading. Uh, you can have a uh, data logger which will actually collect that data on a continuous basis that you specify, be it daily, uh, hourly, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you can have those combined into one. As shown here is a logger and display. Um, and then of course the uh, more sophisticated telemetry where you're transmitting that data in real time via cell phone link uh, up to a network and posting it on a website. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of range uh, in cost and capability for uh, these various technologies. We do have a uh, relatively new UW Extension publication uh, that uh, Scott and I put together on these technologies that uh, is available. At, uh, there's a link to it again on our irrigation website. Uh, 
the URL for that is shown down here in the lower right corner and you can also access that via the uh, UW Extension Learning Store. Um, again, PDF downloads for both of the publications are free of charge. Uh, there is a, a minor charge for hard copies uh, of these publications if you prefer that option. So I mentioned or alluded a little bit earlier to this technology called a variable rate irrigation or VRI. And what is that? Well, VRI allows irrigation water application rates to be varied um, across a, a field uh, in different management zones. All right, so uh, where is it useful? If you, you can reduce overlaps, if you have soil types that vary significantly, a sandy soil in one part of your field versus a silt loam soil in another part, you're going to have very different irrigation management strategies for those soils. Uh, so a variable rate irrigation application uh, fits well with that. Uh, bog your extra dry areas. Um, you can obviously uh, better control your irrigation for your non-cropped areas because you can shut off uh, certain uh, shut off the irrigation system uh, where you don't want to uh, to use it. But uh, also uh, this type of technology is valuable where you've got, as I mentioned, variation in soil types where you can, there is technology out there that will allow uh, you to map the water, soil water holding capacity across a field and then uh, develop an irrigation prescription using variable rate irrigation so that you're uh, managing those zones, those different soil management zones individually. And there's a couple different ways of doing that. There are several levels of variable rate irrigation control that are currently available uh, at varying costs. The first one being the VRI speed control which is simply changing the speed of the pivot uh, for a given sector and that allows the uh, irrigation water control just in that sector as shown on the figure on the left. In the figure in the center it's VRI zone control where actually groups of sprinklers are controlled which allows for again uh, a zone type control system but in blocks uh, that represent are represented by the groups of sprinklers that are controlled for that block. And then to the right is the most sophisticated form uh, of VRI control which is uh, nozzle control where each individual sprinkler nozzle can be controlled uh, by pulsing the signal to the nozzle and opening and closing it uh, at a very rapid rate which allows the flow rate uh, to be controlled to that individual nozzle and that of course is uh, the most expensive option that's available. So to implement these types of technologies uh, you will need of course information on your soil types and variability of soil water holding capacities under the pivot and you will also need uh, some type of uh, control uh, hardware control software uh, and hardware for the center pivot mechanism itself. So it can get very costly uh, but there are, are benefits uh, to the more sophisticated systems. Also um, kind of the current trend is remote sensing and being able to monitor uh, soil moisture content and, and plant health uh, remotely and so uh, we're kind of on the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff right now. Uh, UAVs of course are, are very popular and there's different types of sensor packages that can be put on UAVs that can go out and look at uh, water stress and detect water stress and, and weed stress, pest stress in plants. Um, there's various types and sizes and uh, levels of sophistication of UAVs. And then of course there's also remote sensing satellites. The advantage of course of a UAV being that you have uh, control uh, over that uh, spatially and you can get very high spatial resolution. Uh, you don't have cloud obstructions to deal with and, and those types of things. Uh, but UAVs are also uh, require some licensing and training and uh, some uh, so, uh, processing and analysis of that data uh, to be able to make uh, irrigation management decisions. But 
that's kind of uh, the direction a lot of this uh, technology is going in uh, toward more uh, more sophistication, um, higher technology, uh, and so on and so forth. So that really concludes uh, what I wanted to discuss on irrigation soil water management today. Uh, Scott and I, our contact information uh, is available here on the final slide. Uh, if you have any questions um, or comments, let us know. But uh, this will conclude our second in our series of five uh, irrigation management talks. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you and sharing this information. And we hope it's been useful and uh, provides you uh, with some good guidance in your irrigation water management decisions. Thank you.